Welcome to Weapons Education. We have a very special guest today. His name is Marcus Rivchin. Marcus Rivchin. Thank you for coming on the show. I know you traveled a long distance. You're the real deal. This guy is a Navy SEAL and he's here to tell us about his story and how to become a Navy SEAL and what it was, what it was like between the years of 02 to 05. So tell us about your, your career. Uh, well, I don't like to call myself a Navy SEAL. I defer that to the real operators. You know, I'm, you know, not an operator. So, but in terms of uh, SEAL training, not everyone gets to become one, uh, or actually becomes one in, in their first go around. It took me three tries. And in terms of buds classes, I was in a uh, uh, buds class 167, 168, uh, 199, 233, and 237. What does that mean, buds class? Uh, you know, it also tells you that. Uh, the imposters from the from the real because uh, they always ask uh, what what class were you in and some and people don't know or they kind of flub something if they, and then you kind of gauge what time period they are in and uh, you know for me uh, 167 168 was in late 80s uh, 199 was in the mid 90s and uh, 233 and 237 I was uh, in the, around 2000 2001 period so. So you served in the military for 12 years, and the last three you were telling me you were the Navy SEAL. Right. And what's the difference in the, a Navy SEAL and the operator again, exactly? No, no, they're, they're all, we're, we're all operators, but you know, if you're out of the loop, if you're not in, you know, I, don't, I don't like to you know, call myself a Navy SEAL. You're a humble guy. Yeah. <laughs> you're, you're, but you are. All right. So tell us about the training. Uh, in terms of training, it's... Uh, for, for me, going in the first time when I was uh, uh, 19, 20 years old, it was an eye-opener because I had to uh, train, uh, you know, running in the soft sand and swimming in the ocean. But to experience cold water, it's, it's, uh, it's a, quite a challenge. And the thing about uh, SEAL training or BUDS is that uh, it, they don't give you the, hard, the, the hardest task right off the bat. They build you up. Because it's also a physical and mental buildup. Because uh, everyone has self-preconceived limitations. If I was to ask you, uh, you know, what's the furthest you could run or swim or hold your breath and swim underwater or swim with your hands and feet tucked or doing the amount of sit-ups, you would give a defined number. But when you go through SEAL training, uh, you know, if you think that you know 100 sit-ups is the most you could do at one point you know, that gets broken next week mentally you set a, a different bar. Same thing as running or swimming. For me, the most I ever swam uh, is like a mile and then you're doing it in a, in a pool setting, then doing it in a, in a, a bay setting, in an ocean setting, then, then it gets to 1.5, then two miles, and three miles, then a five and a half mile nautical ocean swim. So once you start uh, breaking these uh, self-perceived barriers, uh, you start to get this attitude or this mental thought that uh, uh, there's no limitations. So you, they build you up to become a mental and physical superman. How long does the whole training process take? Barring injury or academic uh, rollback, uh, you could get in from, if it's boot camp, you know, from boot camp it's two months, depending on uh, what school you go to, to. Now they changed it. But BUDS itself is about like uh, six months. Sometimes you have to wait like two months before you, your class forms up. And so uh, you could go from, from BUDS you know, pretty much eight months of training. That's a lot of training. But when I was in class 233 and 237, I blew up my knee. Uh, they call it the reverse holy triad. I blew out my ACL, uh, a piece, uh, LCL, and the medial meniscus. So anytime I ran or swim and dove, and went through the obstacle course, my knee would pop out of place. And I went with that for like three months before I got rolled. Then I got, and then I was a quadruple roll, so I have to wait from 233 to 237 after surgery to uh, heal up. I saw a story on the History Channel on how difficult that training is. It's absolutely amazing what you guys go through. It's am amazing. And so it's just the mental part of it must be just as hard as the physical part, right? Right. Anyone could, uh, anyone could run, anyone could swim. It's just dealing with the mental challenge. It's uh, people call it the daily grind. Uh, for me, uh, you know, uh, I, I hated the cold water when I first went through. I, I was a uh, 128 pounds, and every time I put on a little more weight. But uh, uh, your body's like a human thermometer. If it gets broken, 
uh, your, your body doesn't adjust properly. So if you get like a heat uh, exhaustion or a heat stroke, your, your human thermometer, you're more prone to heat injuries. And I feel the same way uh, with cold injuries. Uh, every time I get in cold water, I start to shake. But, uh, but the thing is, uh, what you learn mentally is, uh, one of my friends who's, who's a Vietnam era Navy SEAL, he said, uh, inch by inch is a cinch, yard by yard is hard. Meaning, uh, you don't look at the whole picture, you look for the now, at the task at hand, because if you look at the whole picture, it gets overwhelming. So if you just started uh, BUD SEAL training, and, and, and you just had a, a very tough week, then you think, man, I got uh, 25, 30 more weeks. And then, then, then that, that becomes a mind screw. So you just have to look, live for the now, go, hey, all right, well, I got tomorrow. Tomorrow's Wednesday, Wednesday is half the day, and that's downhill to Friday, then I have the weekend, then I have the weekend to recharge to Monday. So it's one of those, you, you have to look at it uh, inch by inch. And if, it, if it's so horrendous, that you can't wait till Wednesday, then you, then you just live for the meal. What about the firearm training? What type of firearm training did you have? Uh, it's, it's basic uh, frontline stuff, which is uh, the M4, what's the equivalent of a, a CAR-15, uh, the Mark 43, which is uh, the M60, and for the, uh, uh, you've got the M79 and the M203 that's attached to M4. So the, imagine you'd have to be a pretty good shot to finally uh, you have to be at least a marksman, but they stress uh, expert in, for pistol and for rifle. And uh, when you go through advanced training, the C SQT, SEAL qualification training, that's where you get the Trident, the SEAL Trident. Um, then you, you go with the uh, MP5, uh, you go with, uh, let me see, some of the heavier caliber, you got the 50 cal, you got... Uh, awesome. AK-47, some, some of the exotic stuff. So He told me some really cool combat stories off camera, but these gentlemen, they're, they're such professionals, they got to keep some things to themselves. Um, but he's done some amazing things to protect our country. He wrote down a few questions for me. Let's see, what can you tell me a little bit about Hell Week? What's that all about? Hell Week is, uh, they call it, it's more like a rite of passage. And when you go through training, uh, if you're starting off as, as a, a student, you're a white shirt because you just have a, a white t-shirt. Anyone who made it through Hell Week, they're known as brown shirts. And at one point, they were known as green shirts. But the white shirts would always look at the brown shirt as uh, something to be impressed upon. And, uh, you know, if you make it through Hell Week, you know, you always want to wear your brown shirt. And what do they do during Hell Week? Uh, it's, uh, it's five and a half days of... Just call it like a triathlon, where you're running, where you're swimming, where you're in the mud, you're doing log PT, you're, you're doing the obstacle course, and you probably get the most, maybe five hours of sleep broken within the five days. That's it? Yeah. In five days? All right. And, uh, and the thing is, by Wednesday, uh, they call it uh, being on automatic, because uh, you know, you're not getting any sleep. So you're, you're just uh, responding automatically. So you're not really phased or thinking about it. They tell you to hit the water, all right, you just do it. Huh. And, uh, and the thing is, by Wednesday, uh, you start to uh, hallucinate. Because if you're not getting any REM sleep, your body has to make up for it. So when you're doing something monotonous, I'm not saying like when you're running, you're hallucinating, but when you're doing the long paddles on the IBS boats, uh, you know, you, people start to see things. I saw like buildings kind of shoot up. <laughs> the, the lights play uh, and the shadows play little tricks. I see a bunch of wait, waitresses going from table to table on, on, on the ocean in, in the Pacific. But, but you don't, but you realize, oh, oh, I'm hallucinating. You're not like freaking out. You're like, oh, so this is what I've heard about. So yeah. some of those combat stories you told me about, I mean, when you're, when you're at war, you don't get sleep sometimes for five, seven, eight days. So I assume that's why they give you that type of training. Uh, they want to make it as realistic as possible and, uh, you know, put people uh, to the breaking point and go beyond. And, uh, and, and then that's the crux of the matter. You want people who could be forged and if, if they break under that, then uh, you don't need them. What percentage of the people fail? Uh, it depends on the season. Uh, normally you get uh, what you call winter classes and summer classes. Uh, the winter classes have a higher attrition because you're in the in the colder environment a lot, and uh, when uh, when you're shaking like a leaf, and the wind is blowing, you don't want to be in the water. You know, it, 
it's it's uh, you get a, a psychological scar. For me, uh, for a while, when I take when I went to take a shower, I would turn on the water, take a few steps back, make sure it's warm. Then I then I stepped in. And so. you said it took you three three tries to ultimately become a seal. Is that right? Right. Three tries. And the, the attrition is probably uh, they say about thirty percent on average. Uh, it would probably be uh, a little less during the, for the winter classes. And uh, what is land warfare all about? It's one of your questions. Uh, land warfare training, uh, it's where you learn how to react to certain situations, uh, whether you get a contact in the front or the rear or to the left or right. They call it immediate action dr uh, drills, IADs, where something happens, you're supposed to respond immediately because uh, hesitation could, be, could mean death. So if you get like a contact front and you don't know uh, the size of your opposition, you would probably do, want to do an Australian peel, but still have the front people uh, you know, do a full burst and just peel, you know, do a center peel. So there's no blue on blue where you, I accidentally shoot you. So everything's choreographed. Just look at it like a, like a football team. Now, let's tell the viewers, in your opinion, if uh, you're talking to an 18-year-old out there who's contemplating on joining the Navy mm -hmm. or any part of the armed forces, what is your recommendation? Do you think it's a good career? Uh, make sure uh, they know what they want. Make sure they get it in writing. Okay. You know, yeah, you know it's, it's like anything else. Uh, joining the military is a contract. If, if you want to do something but it's not in writing, uh, you know, then you'll have to buy Brewick, uh, beware. Uh, also, uh, get the most out of it because they're getting the most out of you. So if you're young, get involved with the GI Bill, get involved in the Navy College Fund, any other little things that would help you beyond your career because, like anything else, uh, you know, something could happen, your career could be over, or, or you're in that career, but, you know, there's always... Uh, you know, you can't be a SEAL forever. Much as a, a football player can't be a football player forever. You have to uh, go beyond and prove your skill sets in a different capacity. Well, you stayed in the military for 12 years, so you kept uh, renewing your contracts. Right. Uh, and the reason why is that, um, you know, a lot of people have uh, plans and goals. Well, a lot of people have plans, but not people have goals. If you have a goal, at least you have direction in life. And for me, uh, when I caught the SEAL bug, wanting to be a SEAL, that was my focus. I didn't want to go through life in my old age, would-haves, should-haves, or could-haves. You know, I wanted to go with a clear conscience, and I wanted to give it as much of an effort as possible. And uh, I knew, you know, not making the first time or the second time, uh, it's, it's a blow psychologically because, uh, you know, there, there was, you know, it was a 24-7 preoccupation about SEAL training, not making it. And for me, uh, uh, it's, a, it's a form of, a, of exorcism to actually make it through. Because there's some people who didn't make it, wanted to, but didn't, didn't pursue that. And uh, you know, for them, it's a longer process to get it out of the system. Mm -hmm. Or if some people will never be out of their system. So. Any tips on them on how they should get into the military? Uh, and get the grants, like you said, and things like that? Well, uh, you know, talk to anybody who's been in the military. Okay. And make sure they're with the recruiter and, you know... Uh, and they're comfortable. Yeah, they're comfortable and, you know, everything's all laid out. But for you, it was ultimately the right decision. Yeah. Yeah, good. I know, I want to say one last thing. Um, you're running for Congress. Do you want to talk about that? Uh, for me, uh, it's my second time running for office. Uh, I ran for State House, and the reason why I did it is because I believe Congress is a broken system, mm -hmm. and I believe in uh, the, the last line of defense for anything is the state, the state government. So I believe in state rights, but uh, I didn't win because uh, the person with the most money yeah. usually wins. Uh, this time around, uh, it takes something out of you, like SEAL training, financially, psychologically, if you're a small business owner, uh, it devastates your business running for office. Uh, the, the reason why I ran the second time is because a super committee uh, it got voted upon in the whole Miami Day delegation, and part of Broward voted for the super committee, and that's where we effectively lost our representation. You know, we, 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 there, there is no veto, there is no debate, there is no argument about any f financial issues. It's all determined by uh, 12, maybe 13 people. And I, I take issue with that, uh, being a, a, a veteran, you know, when you swear an oath to the Constitution, 
you know, that's, that's your, your fidelity to it. And for me, the reason why I'm running, uh, that I'm inspired to run, is because elected officials shouldn't get a free pass for voting for bad bills. Even though, I, you know, it's unlikely to win against a 20-year incumbent, uh, you know, they, they have to be challenged. Right. Because if they don't get challenged in the primary, because, you know, they all live pretty much in a gerrymandered district, they get this attitude that no matter how they vote, it doesn't matter. You What's know? your opinion on the Second Amendment while we're talking about the Constitution? Uh, it's the bedrock of this, of this republic, as well as the First. You can't have a First Amendment, freedom of speech, without the Second Amendment. And, uh, you know, and then it's also a check in place if our government gets abusive. And as uh, uh, Admiral Yamato mentioned about this plan, about proposal about attacking the U.S., it's, like, it's the stupidest idea because every blade of grass is going to be a, an armed citizen defending it. So, uh, you know, and, and studies have proven that, you know, if, if, if you're armed, an armed citizen, there's less crime. That's right. And when you have, like, crime-safe zones, it doesn't protect crime. Yeah. You know, it, it actually encourages it. You know, and, uh, you know, I look at a, at a gun store or, or a gun show, there, there's no robberies there. That's, that's right. You know, that's, that's uh, you know, if you want to uh, initiate a form of suicide, go right at it. So. I just thought of one more question before we finish up. Uh, Bin Laden was taken out by the Navy right. SEALs. Right. Uh, what type of special unit was that that took out the monitor? Do you know? You, well, you don't know I'm asking that question. The public knows it as uh, SEAL Team 6, uh, but uh, the official moniker is uh, Naval Special Development Group, or DEV Group. They're known as a, a Tier 1 asset. They're equivalent of uh, uh, Delta Force, or what is commonly known as CAG. There are SEALs, and then there's uh, the Green Berets, and what, the step above them are the Delta, Delta Force, or CAG and uh, SEAL Team 6 or, or, or uh, a dev group. So those guys are yeah, SEAL Team 6? Right. That's and, a and, and, to, and to be in, uh, into damn that, that group, uh, you have to be a SEAL. You have to go for at least two deployments. So you're, you're, you're well seasoned and you have to uh, come with good recommendation. If, you, if, you, if, you, if your reputation is a screw up and you apply, your name goes on a wall and if anybody makes a, a bad comment, then you know, uh, you're you're not in, you're you don't get a chance to play with the big boys. Yeah, very so interesting. So it's 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 its own little uh, weeding out process at that point. Then then you go through some highly intense counterterrorism training. Excellent. That, that uh, weeds it out. But they they are the tip of the spear. Well, you're a humble guy. Thank you for your service. No All of our viewers, thank you. We thank will you. support you when you run for Congress. Check it out. Thought you might find this interesting. See you next time.